traceability management. Uh, my name is Fraser Thompson. I'm the MES consultant here with Simlogic in the UK. And thank you all for taking time out of your day to join this webinar. Before we get to, to the good stuff, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout the duration of the webinar, there is a questions box that should appear in your GoToWebinar control panel on the right hand side if you just expand where it says questions. Type your questions in the box there, they'll come through to me and uh, we're intending to have a couple of minutes at the end where we can look to answer some of those questions but if we don't get answers to your questions we will reply uh, via email. We're looking to take around 40 minutes, so we should be done at around 20 to 4 uh, this afternoon, so we'll try and keep within those, within those time constraints. So, just a little bit of background, uh, firstly, uh, myself, uh, Fraser Thompson, again, uh, the MAS consultant with Simlogic. My experience is, goes back maybe 10 or so years in food and beverage, pharmaceutical, medical devices, uh, primarily within MES, Manufacturing Operations Management, of which traceability is a, is a key part. Uh, Simlogic as a company, we're, we're based in the UK, just north of Bradford, uh, in a little town called Saltaire. That's us there in that little building, it's, uh, it's very nice. Uh, we are a partner of Parsec Automation, uh, who are one of the leading MES MOM solution providers using a tool called Traxis. So when we, when we look at our solutions a little bit later on in the webinar, we'll be using Traxis as those solutions. And our goal as Simlogic is to deliver outstanding manufacturing solutions, enabling our customers to be world-class performers. That's kind of key to everything that we do. And the little tag cloud in the bottom right-hand corner there, again, just kind of covers all of the areas within MES and MOM where uh, we have particular uh, expertise or specialities. Um, one of those, again, is uh, traceability, but also to that is quality, batch management, SOPs, energy, inventory, and so on. So what are we going to run through today? Uh, so first off, we're going to define what is traceability, but with a manufacturing perspective. Um, that's what we're talking about here today, is manufacturing traceability, so let's focus on, on that, and then look at why it's important. What is uh, guiding us in the industry? What do we need to, rules do we need to adhere to, and why do we need to do it? Then we'll cover a little bit about some of the challenges that people face when trying to implement uh, a system, uh, now, when I say a system, um, we look at particularly looking at um, electronic traceability systems rather than manual traceability systems. So we are focusing on how we get data into an electronic system. Uh, some of the top challenges will come up in there. Uh, I'll then run you through a, a very quick scenario on uh, the general traceability implementation, the implementation of traceability systems. Uh, we've got some recommendations about how to proceed, and then as I say, we'll have some time at the end for a couple of questions. So firstly, uh, as we said, <coughs> Manufacturing traceability. So there's a good, a good definition from uh, the US uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, the FDA. Um, it's traceability means the ability to track any food, feed, food producing animal or substance that will be used for consumption throughout all stages of production, processing and distribution. That's fairly, um, fairly wide, it's a fairly broad spectrum, but it, it, it covers everything. It's anything that is going to be consumed or touched or used by uh, the end user uh, that could potentially cause harm to them, we're, we're going to need to uh, be traceable on the ingredients, the materials that have got into that production. Uh, in the event that we have some kind of food safety incident, whether it be a product recall for a contamination or some other reason, um, it's going to enable us to identify and subsequently withdraw or recall unsafe products from the market, and that might be foodstuffs that uh, should not have dairy products in or nut products in. Again, we need to be able to trace those down uh, and identify all batches, all the jobs that contain the product that they shouldn't have had, so we can recall that product very quickly. So again, we need to be able to verify the product's history, its location, its application, the ingredients that, that went into it to be able to build up this full, this full picture of, of its, uh, some people call it genealogy or traceability.
Very quickly, I thought I would touch on the differences between traceability or serialization. So serialization is quite a key topic at the moment within the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, what we're talking about here within this webinar is, is not serialization, it's more traceability. And some of the serialization typically refers to the unique labeling and tracking of the smallest package items. So if you take uh, an example of a pharmaceutical manufacturer that's perhaps manufacturing tablets, they're putting those tablets into blister packs. We by identifying the blister pack, the carton that that blister pack goes into, the box that that carton goes into, the pallet that that, that, that carton goes onto, and so on, and being able to have that fully serialized and we've got we can track exactly where that product has come from. Um, the primary purpose of this serialization is for uh, brand purposes, counterfeit protection. Um, what we're talking about is traceability, so it's more about looking at the higher level identification of lots and groups of lots and production materials that have gone into, into finished goods. So I just thought I would uh, set some expectations to start. So, why is traceability important? So, there are, there are a number of factors that are going to mean that we need to put a traceability system in, or we need systems uh, to be able to trace our, our finished goods. Uh, and those could be many. Uh, we're going to start with, say, regulatory compliance. It may be that we've got um, a, a governing body within our industry that's governing the type of records that we need to keep. Um, but it may be that we're looking at it just improving product quality. Um, Again, we want happy customers, we want satisfied customers, they're going to want to come back to us with repeat orders, repeat business, uh, and they're not going to come back if they're unsatisfied with the quality of what you're producing. Now that could be um, product that is of, of bad quality, shall we say, so something that needs to be recalled, that contains the wrong product or the wrong packaging materials, or it could be um, product that is still saleable but is out of specification and we need to know the reasons that it's out of our specification and being able to trace that and track that through the production process. Uh, when it comes to product safety or recall situations, we need to make sure that we are fast and efficient, that we're very responsive and we're able to get all of the detail as quickly as possible and present that in a manageable and digestible fashion. Uh, if you're currently using paper-based traceability systems, I'm sure you're aware of the various pitfalls of such systems and that uh, the information can be time consuming to generate and to gather. Um, if you get a spot audit, for example, from uh, a retailer, um, it can take you a, a number of hours, if not days, to produce all the information that are required, whereas with a, a good electronic traceability system, we should be able to gather all this data very quickly within a few clicks of, of a mouse. We're looking at protecting our brand reputation, and that kind of goes hand in hand with quality, and then increasing visibility of the complete supply chain. So not only are we looking at traceability within the confines of our own four walls, we're looking at what comes in and also what goes out. So what is happening in our in our suppliers' factories, of our suppliers of our raw materials, and also what's happening in the logistics effort, the warehousing, and the distribution supply chains that are, are further downstream. So, when it comes to regulatory compliance, there are various um, legislations depending on what market you're exporting to or you're producing for. Um, pharmaceutical uh, medical devices are far and away the most heavily regulated and have the most demands on traceability systems and some of the regulations you can see there on the screen, particularly uh, one that's quite key um, for us. Uh, and obviously within the within the US market is the, the FDA's 21 CFR Part 11 for electronic records and signatures. And again, we need to make sure that all our electronic records uh, cannot be manipulated, everything's signed for at any point, anyone's making any changes to the systems that needs to be traceable and tracked down to the individual level. <coughs> Excuse me. Within the uh, food and beverage industry, again, there are numbers of, uh, of legislations that must be adhered to, both within the EU and the UK, the Food Safety Act, um, EU regulations, as we can see there here, the Food Standards Agency is, is defining traceability and withdrawal and recall standards. Um, and there's various other food information labeling requirements, uh, and again, the FDA get involved as well from a US perspective. 
Now, when we go outside of sort of food and beverage uh, and pharmaceutical, there, there is less legislation uh, out there that um, that we need to adhere to, uh, and we often find that um, legislations are kind of implemented on a local or a regional basis, uh, and even voluntarily at site level, uh, as as and when different uh, users define the rules. Uh, for example, if you're producing uh, some kind of chemical products that's saying it's not for human consumption or for animal consumption, but it is used in other uh, industries. Again, you may choose to have your own um, levels of standards with traceability within that. So what are the challenges that we're going to face uh, when we're looking at traceability systems? Well, firstly, um, we're all being demanded uh, we've got more demanded of us now by our by our customers, by our end users, uh, especially if we're in retail. Again, spot audits are very very common, um, and people are demanding good traceability, regulatory compliance, uh, and timely information. Now, as you can imagine, all of the data that would go into a traceability system, or any other electronic batch recording system. Uh, the data is going to come from multiple or disparate data sources and it's going to be difficult to manage by its very nature. We might have order information, stock information that's held within our ERP. We might have uh, warehouse and logistics information that's held within our warehouse management system. We're going to have live real-time process data and variables that are contained within our PLCs. And what we need to do is we need to bring all of that together uh, and wrap it up and combine it with input from from real people uh, who may have opinions and perspectives on why things might be out of specification or why certain actions haven't been completed. So this um, this data map is is a complex data map uh, and it's going to be difficult to put together. We want to improve our product safety and product genealogy. We want to limit the risk of cross contamination between batches. Again, we want to make sure if we're producing a, a non dairy batch that it doesn't follow a dairy batch or that if it does the correct cleaning procedures have taken place. So again, our, our traceability picture should indicate what cleaning on what production equipment has taken place before and after, if necessary, as derived by whatever business rules you may have. We need to be able to easily access this information in the event of a product recall. So as I was saying, we need to get to it within a couple of clicks of a mouse uh, or open up in a generation of a very quick uh, web-based report. Uh, and we need to look at, uh, I've called it inventory con control here, but um, we'll go further on or, or deeper into lot identification a little bit later on, how we identify an individual lot of a finished good on when we should divide up a new lot to, to give us traceability down to the lot level. So we've looked at the challenges. What are, what are people's objectives at the moment? So according to LNS research, this is from the back end of 2013, uh, looking at um, objectives of manufacturing companies and what their objectives were. And again, the top, uh, the top resulting objective is focused on consistent quality of products. That's key. So everybody is, is very much focused, or I want to say everybody, 61% of everybody is very much focused on delivering good quality products as their number one objective. Uh, and traceability and quality management fit exactly within that within that bucket. Some of the other challenges are, uh, as, it, as you can see here, the lack of collaboration across different departments or disparate data systems and data sources. It, it used to be uh, five or ten years ago people would talk about islands of automation. Uh, so if you're in a, uh, a reasonably well automated manufacturing environment, you may have um, a set of manufacturing equipment that's running on one type of PLC that's totally disconnected from your packaging equipment that runs on PLC and scanner equipment from a different vendor. They don't talk to each other. The data is separate. Um, that landscape is, is very much changing uh, nowadays. So automation systems are becoming much more interlinked and intertwined and will continue to, to do so really with the, um, with the growth of, of the Internet of Things and things like that. Um, well, what we find a lot nowadays is that people aren't necessarily talking about islands of automation, we're talking about islands of data. So again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of data in our ERP system, we've got a lot of data in our WMS system, we've got a lot of data in our quality management system. Are these data sources in any way linked? Do they talk to each other? Do they um, interact with each other? Do they share information? Do they report on the information together? So, 
what I thought I would do very quickly is just look at uh, sort of the cost of product recalls and highlight maybe sort of five or so of big product recalls or food safety incidents that have occurred over the last sort of 30 years. Um, because uh, if you haven't experienced a product recall, you maybe don't have an impact of the true, the true value of having good product traceability. Um, product recalls can cost millions and millions and millions of pounds. For example, we go back to the Spanish toxic oil syndrome in the 1980s, there were over 600 deaths uh, due to a, a food poisoning. Uh, we've got examples of food colorants that were later found to be carcinogenic that needed to be recalled. Uh, and then most recently there in the UK is the horse meat scandal in 2013. Now, although it's not a, um, a food safety issue uh, per se, it was a fraud issue. So. Um, uh, red meat advertised as being beef was actually horse meat um, and you can see the impact there on the frozen red meat market in the UK fell by 15% in one calendar year, um, which is quite substantial and would have an impact throughout uh, the supply chain. So that kind of paints the picture for um, the need for having good uh, actionable traceability systems in real time. But how are we going to get there? Um, we may be sat with a, a paper-based system at the moment. How are we going to get there? How are we going to get to this, this, this future vision of having a complete electronic traceable, traceability system? Well, firstly, we need to look at how we automate the collection of manufacturing data. Uh, so that would be down to our shop level uh, systems, collecting data from PLCs, looking at tag changes, trends of temperatures, humidity levels, other variables that may impact the product quality. Um, but we need to combine that data with manual observations. So, for example, if at uh, half past three, uh, Bob on line two needs to do a quality check, um, we need to confirm that he's completed that quality check and what his results are. Uh, now, if you're running a paper-based system, it may be possible that he doesn't complete his quality check system, his quality check, uh, but he does sign on the piece of paper maybe at, at four o'clock that at half past three he did do it. Now, we're never going to get away from, from human error or the actions that, that humans could take. But as far as, as reasonably possible, we want to um, make as much of it automated as possible so that we don't give people the opportunity to make those kind of mistakes. And all we're asking people to do is to add observations, to add a little bit of clarity to the information that's automatically been captured. We want to notify people in real time if there's any non-conformance or quality issues um, because Honestly, if, uh, if we wait till the end of the day or the end of the batch to say that actually the first job of the batch was of poor quality, uh, we've introduced a lot of waste into the, into the system, a lot of waste of product, a lot of waste of time. So as soon as we detect something as being uh, non-conforming, we notify the correct people at the right time. We want to analyze and contextualize the data throughout the value stream. So again, this is about having, again, a little bit about what I said before, but having the right data to the right people at the right time. Um, there's no point waiting till the end of the shift to tell the production manager uh, that the quality of the start of the batch was, was poor and now needs to be scrapped and by the way you're going to need to quarantine the entire batch and perform QC on everything. <coughs> so uh, what I'd like to do now is just run you through um, a little bit of a, a worked example, it's just a worked example on, on PowerPoint, um, but in my example I've got a production facility that's making, uh, let's, let's call it cereal bars, uh, and this is the, the rough process in, in diagrammatic form but also in words, so we've got raw materials into the system, into the factory, we've got bulk materials that maybe get stored in silos, just peanuts, almonds, raisins, flour, wheat, but we've also then got uh, bagged or boxed materials such as bags, cases and labels. Now, obviously that's uh, it's not necessarily a raw ingredient, but it is a material that can cause traceability or product recall problems. If you make the correct batch, but you put that batch into the wrong bags or the wrong product cases, um, essentially we've got an issue there and we need to recall that product. So it's not as advertised. So again, we're going to store our bulk in silos, in bags and cases, and silo, um, managing products in silos is, is again quite tricky and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail as we get into the solution. We're then going to process our ingredients, we're going to mix them together, we're going to make our cereal bar up, uh, we're going to assign them batch numbers, lot numbers, job numbers, uh, and we're going to package those um, cereal bars into boxes, into packs, into pallets. 
Um, we're going to consume those raw materials, boxes, cases, containers. Uh, we're going to do some QC testing. So uh, at various points, whether it be one in 400, one every half hour, we're going to take a sample, make sure it's up to spec, it's the right weight, it's got the right ingredients in it. And we're then going to ship our finished product. So it's going to go into our warehouse, maybe get stored for a while, and then go on to a logistics company to distribute that out to retail. So that's our full, our full picture, almost farm to fork. So very quickly, we're going to start with a, with a tainted product. Now, in this example, my peanut product uh, is tainted. There is, there is a problem with it that's been identified by one of my suppliers. They've said that actually lot A of our peanuts of barcode 1234 um, actually didn't contain peanut. It contained walnuts, for example. Uh, so we need to find out what happened to that batch. Well, as it happens, we know that it's currently in production in lot A, um, but it's only one of four materials that goes into that lot. So here we've identified the material lot three is the contaminated or the tainted product. That's gone into production lot A. We, we know we're going to need to recall that. But we can go a step further back than that. We can say, okay, well, that material we know came from this vendor, and that vendor potentially made or produce that uh, tainted product at the following factories, so we can trace it all the way back through the through the supply chain, through the value chain, and then forwards in the other direction as well. So as well as being used in production lot A, we've also used our contaminated product in production lot B. Those two production lots got stored in the warehouse, at various different locations that may have come into contact with other products that shouldn't have contained peanuts, that may have contained peanuts that we then need to trace. Uh, and that finally finished good from the warehouse was then distributed to the following retail outlets. So straight away, just by being able to identify our tainted product and identify it somehow, whether it be a barcode or a, or a serial number, is to get a full picture of our traceability. Uh, and within seconds or minutes, we're able to then go and say, actually, to these six retailers, uh, we need to recall production lot A, production lot B, produced on these dates in this equipment by these operators with these variables because and we can do that very quickly and efficiently. <clears throat> so let's just take a little bit more of a, a, a stepwise approach through that process. So we've got our material receiving uh, goods in to the system. Um, we may get goods from many different suppliers that would all have their own method of identification. They won't necessarily all have the same barcoding standard, or you may be driving barcode standards to your suppliers. Either way, we can we can mark incoming materials with some kind of lot identification through typically through barcoding or through RFID. Uh, we're then going to track that material around within our system. So it, it's possible that before we actually use that system, we're going to move it around within the facility, track its movements, what other products it comes in contact with. Um, that's then going to become some kind of finished goods or some kind of work in progress. Now that's going to need unique identifying numbers, batch numbers. Every time we move products into a new container, we're going to need to track that container number and trace it all the way back to the to the original received raw materials. We're then going to consume that material. Um, so we're going to say, for example, again, using the example of our cereal bar, I'm going to consume 25 kilos of raisins from, from batch 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and then I might put the rest of that batch back in the in the warehouse or, or only take what I need from the silo. Uh, and then finally, we're going to ship that, that finished goods out. So again, it might, again, as I say, it might go into the warehouse. It might move around a couple of locations. Uh, we may need to capture some tracking information from our logistics company. Uh, and again, sort of a bit more diagrammatically, we've got various different touch points uh, along the process where, as you can see by the orange dots, we're going to need some kind of uh, data capture or, or data input from operators at various different points in the process in order to build up this electronic picture of traceability. So, uh, a little bit more detail again. So our peanuts, they come in on a delivery, for example. Uh, this delivery contains three lots of peanuts that are identified here by these three lot numbers. They come into our factory, we scan them, we scan the barcode into the system. Um, we get the quantity that comes into the system and also the vendor lot number. Uh, as far as possible, we are electronically storing this information. Uh, as you can see here on the, on the screenshots, in our example, we're electronic, electronically capturing the quality, quantity, the lot number, which doc it was received on, 
uh, and which silo it, it was received into in the case of bulk ingredients. Now, I touched on this a little bit earlier on that the silos are, are a little bit harder to manage uh, with raw materials. And so I'll just I'll, I'll just flash back to that. So, for example, if we had a a, a silo that contained flour, uh, and this flour, the said silo, had a had a one ton capacity, and I had half a ton of uh, of of batch one two three four. I then had um, quarter of a ton of batch two three four five, and another quarter of a, a batch of three four five six. I've essentially got three different lots of the same raw material within my one silo. What we need to be able to do when we discharge our silo is obviously understand a little bit about the the physics of how our silo is going to discharge. If I'm taking from the bottom of the silo, uh, I would expect that I'd be taking batch one, two, three, four first, uh, and then when I've consumed half a ton, perhaps I'm then going to take batch two, three, four, five, and so on and so on. But in reality, we know that's not the case. Uh, we know the way that um, the silos discharge may that mean that our lots are going to become mixed, they're going to become combined and potentially potentially contaminated. So if lot 2345 uh, we later find had some kind of contamination in it, that uh, potential issue is then going to spread to our other two lots that are in the silo with it at the same time. So when we're consuming bulk materials, we do need to be a little bit careful about assigning individual lot numbers and being sure that that's what it is. Um, in the case where we're just doing manual weighments of ingredients, it's uh, it's it's a little bit more simple to capture. You know, we want to just enter 25 kilos. It comes from a 25 kilo bag. We empty that 25 kilo bag, and we know that we've just had material from one batch. Uh, but in silos, we need to do things a little bit a little bit more smart. So material tracking and movement around the, the warehouse, again, barcoding, RFID, uh, good good technologies, inexpensive, very easy to implement. So again, we want to look at tracking containers by barcodes, storage locations by barcodes. Anytime something is moving around the system, we want to capture who's moved it, why they moved it. Uh, and again, touching on again the storage of bulk materials there at the bottom. What that might look like then graphically from a real-time interface is that we get uh, a view of what's stored where, how long it's been there. Again, some of this information may come direct from your warehouse management system. It may already be there. It may already be available to you. It's just not available in real-time or in a graphical format that makes it easy to view and interpret and to build up that picture of traceability. When we come to identifying finished goods, again, I talked a little bit about breaking finished goods down into lots, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a couple of minutes about how we do that and what might impact how we change lot numbers and so on. Uh, but again, talking about using the electronic system, particularly Traxxas in this particular case, is what other events are we going to need to capture along the way? So production date timestamps, process variable trends, uh, while this batch was in execution, do I need to capture a trend of the temperature of the humidity of the of the room, the ambient temperature, the runtime of an oven? Um, there may be various HACCP or quality related tasks and tests that need to be completed along the way. Uh, I gave the example a little earlier on about a quality test that might be due at, at half past three. Was that quality test done? Was it done on time? What were the results? If the result was a fail, what was the follow-up workflow actions that should have taken place and did they take place? Is it the case that we have to now scrap that material or do we now just need to notify somebody that, that perhaps we're moving out of specification? Again, that, that difference in these real-time notifications of something is, is out of specification but still saleable, but we need to take action to make sure that it continues to be so, or it's out of specification, it's poor quality, and it needs to become waste or scrap, or it needs to be reworked in some in some manner. Um, we also need to look at uh, capturing any, any time there's approvals required in the system, so it may be for certain actions to take place. We need the presence or the approval of a QC representative or a operations manager. Uh, it may be that we just want to capture notes and observations from operators to say, okay, um, it was a particularly hot day today, so the ambient temperature was up. Uh, that's affected the actual temperature of the product, but it's still within specification. Therefore, 
Uh, it's a note that's gone on the traceability report, but it's not something that's going to cause a recall or a, a, a direct quality issue at that point in time. <clears throat> so what might they look like in, in reality? Uh, here I've got a, a quick example of uh, a batch that needs to be executed. So I need to execute batch uh, 6628 of this particular product. And I've got various tasks that need to be completed, some of which are manual, some of which are automatic. And those manual tasks here are indicated, they're highlighted by the little red boxes. Um, what that would do would bring up operator control forms on your electronic system. So the idea is that we'd have some kind of interface, be it a tablet or a PC on the shop floor, where the operators can identify themselves. And here in this example, the operators will identify themselves by name and also by password. Now, that could be via a magnetic card, via an RFID tag, via a fingerprint identification. It's more a means of technology. Uh, and about what information you actually need to capture. Is it necessary for you to capture a password? Depending on your industry and the regulations, it may well be. We're then going to ask the operators to do their, their checks. So here, for example, I've got my pre-run checks. They're defined as put your gloves on, make sure the mix is clean, put on your silly hat, uh, and, and make sure you've got a slightly cooler chef shirt on. Make sure all those tasks have been ticked. It may be that we just want to do QC samples. So after X amount of time, take some quality samples off the line, send them to the lab, and they can all be prompted to the users in real time on the shop floor. Every time we do this, every time we touch data, every time manually or automatically or we consume raw materials, what we're doing behind the scenes is we're logging all of this information back into the database. Everything's getting stored, getting logged, getting backed up, getting archived building up this complete picture behind the scenes. We've then got our, our automated tasks. Uh, so in this case, again, I've got add raisins, add other materials. And this time we're going to be connecting into things like the PLCs, the SCADA systems, capturing this information in real time. It may be that we also want to capture some of the manual data that could be captured from uh, mobile devices, from mobile phones, from tablets, uh, and so on. And then finally, off into finished goods, off into the warehouse. Um, again, into containers, into storage locations, into rack locations, tracking distribution companies and logistics companies. All the time, but bringing in as much data as possible. So you can see so from, from the challenges that we mentioned at the start, multiple disparate data sources, lots of data. Um, but importantly, if it's gathered automatically, it's as accurate as it can possibly be at the time. So we, I touched on very quickly is looking at um, finished goods, lot identification, how we go about doing this. So what we want to do is not just say, um, all right, batch X was contaminated with a dairy product and it shouldn't have dairy in it, therefore recall absolutely everything we produced in batch X. That's, that's great. That may tick all of the boxes. It may cover all eventualities. Uh, but it also may leave some areas open to error. And that's why we want to break things down beyond the batch, beyond the job, to individual lot numbers. Uh, and lot numbers should change on certain production criteria, such as certain production events, such as changing raw materials, changing certain pieces of equipment, operators, the shift, temperature variable, production variable, speed, temperature. Uh, and the more frequent this lot number changes, or the smaller the lot size is, the more granular detail we're going we're gonna to get for our traceability picture. It's going to be easier to pinpoint exact items that need to be recalled uh, and be able to do it quicker, rather than just having a, a gut reaction that says recall all of this batch. So as a, as a very quick sort of diagrammatical example, here I've got in individual bags, I'm going to call them bags, individual bags of a certain material that were produced. Each square represents a bag. Um, now, we started off with product one in large bags. So uh, the first eight or ten or however many there are there um, are defined as product one, and then we move on to product two. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same product, but in smaller bags. We produced that for a period of time. 
and then at a point of time later on we have a changeover and we're now running a spicy product so we've added some chili to the product uh, again and we're now producing that product in that same period of time we've been using different types of raw materials so here uh, all three products that we've produced consume peanuts but we've actually only used peanuts from two different lot numbers so product one product two have used raw material one peanuts from lot one two three and product two and product three have used peanuts from raw material two lot four five six so as you can see we're starting to build up a little bit of complexity here into the uh, into the process <clears throat> so as it, as it states above every time we change something or do something we need to be identifying a, a different finished lot number so in the first example we start with product one raw material one we're on finished lot a as we move through we're still using the same raw materials but now we're producing product two in small bags I'm now using a different type of bag so I've created a new finished lot finished lot B moves all the way up until we now change raw materials so I'm still producing the same product now I've got a different raw material I need to identify a separate lot number lot C uh, and then again I keep on the same raw materials but I change my product again and I've changed into now another finished lot D so this time rather than saying okay we had an issue with um, for example I think the issue was with pro was with product two let's recall all of product two in uh, actuality our issue may have been with raw material two and not just product two so what we need to do is recall finish lot C and finish lot D now that, having that information to hand is great because it's prevented us from recalling the first half or finish lot B of product two which was actually good saleable product and it's actually identified to us that we, we do still need to recall product three so having this level of detail this level of granularity is key to having a good efficient reliable traceability system so how is technology going to really help us with that so I said at the start that we we're going to have kind of a, an electronic spin on traceability run the manual uh, data entry program uh, and again our background is is manufacturing execution systems manufacturing operation management so how is that going to help us so it, it's everything that I've just talked about really it's the data tracking it's automated weighing and dispensing uh, for accurate for consistent recipe control uh, we're minimizing the errors by operators by automated systems by being in control at every step of the process and we're replacing all of our our paper-based documentation with electronic batch records again we're reducing the amount of paperwork on the shop floor we're increasing the reliability and the speed of return of all of this data we're able to track in a lot more detail right down to this lot level that we were just talking about we've instantly got better inventory management um, ideas of our ingredients we're involving operators in the improvement process uh, and as it states there in the blue the ROI for these kind of systems can be very very fast and have real real benefits so some recommendations if this is a kind of thing that you're looking into you're looking to move from a manual traceability system to an electronic system is and the first one is key there is set your objectives and understand the key requirements of your facility they will not be the same as the facility next door that makes a product that is slightly similar you will have your own unique requirements that need to be defined um, again research regulatory requirements it may be you've got your own uh, <coughs> regula regulatory control department that is looking after that for you it may be that you don't and you need to investigate that uh, there are industry standards and best practices that can be leveraged so don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel completely um, but do do your research um, traceability solutions and solution providers are more than just hardware and software sellers um, if you do find somebody out there that is selling a traceability system that will meet your needs 100% out of the box uh, please drop me an email I would love to speak to them um, these kind of systems really do need to be tailored and engineered to meet your individual requirements uh, and finally um, <clears throat> the final two points there is, is select an integrator with experience in traceability and one that you trust um, it's important to build on on trust and create partnerships we're not looking at uh, these kind of systems don't work with a, uh, a customer and supplier type relationship it needs to be a partnership a collaboration uh, I heard somebody say quite recently that uh, collaboration is the new innovation and I, I really strongly believe that that is the case 
Uh, very finally, conscious of the time, um, and I'm running slightly towards the end of uh, the 40 minutes. Here's just a couple of references uh, for us here at Simlogic and Traxis of recent traceability projects that we've been involved with. The first with Premier Nutrition, who are a animal feeds uh, manufacturer, specialty animal feeds manufacturer here in the UK. And there's a quote there from uh, their project manager about the advantages uh, that they have seen from implementing this kind of system. And finally, uh, another reference there from uh, the Netherlands uh, with Novobi, uh, which has uh, yielded, uh, it says they're in bold, an 80% accuracy improvement in the dosing of ingredients uh, into, their, into their mixes. So I've, uh, I've consumed all of the time in there, but I do have uh, one question that I can quickly answer. So I'll just have a look at the, the questions box on there. Okay, uh, so can Traxis integrate with SAP? Uh, so the answer is yes, we can definitely integrate with SAP or many other types of ERP system. And there are industry standards way to, standard ways to do this. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, a standard called B2MML that would allow the exchange of information in XML format between uh, MES and uh, ERP level systems uh, and not just SAP across the board really for things like JD Edwards or Microsoft Dynamics or so on. And so uh, again being conscious of time uh, we will respond to all of the questions uh, via email. If you do have any more questions or you'd like to speak further or just have a look at some of our information again please visit our website at www.simlogic.co.uk or feel free to give us a call or drop us an email and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the next webinar. Thank you for your time.